Okay, good. So, today we have a beautiful lecture. We will talk about uh, textures and maps. Again, this is basically our second lecture about textures and maps. And uh, these are our learning goals for today. We will talk about types of textures. We already discussed a little bit about that on, on, on our previous uh, lecture. Uh, I will uh, show you other uses for textures, right? We already saw that we can use the color of the texture not only for like literally painting the color of the material, but also to create different surface effects, right? We, we will use now textures for other type of stuff. We'll talk about mapping. That is basically how you decide uh, to wrap your objects with your texture or how your texture is basically distributed in your object surface. And that is related with something called parametrization, which is a very uh, hard problem in computer science. And we will finally see the actual 3.js example on how you can get the color of your texture. And at the end of the lecture today, uh, we will talk about our shader assignment that is already uh, on the web page. It took me a lot of time preparing preparing the material uh, because yeah, I, I wanted to give you like a very fun um, idea for for the um, the bonus part. So it's already there. It's already on the, on our web page. I, I I will show you a little bit of, of that, and we will discuss a little bit of the possible solution for the bonus. Okay, and yes, we have this. <laughs> my my pumpkin or my squash that you're insisting in destroying me <laughs> saying that it's a garlic okay yeah I, I think that the white version looked like a gar garlic but yeah okay so this is what we were talking last time right we have textures we can use these textures on different ways right and depending on how we are using the texture uh, we basically we call them uh, maps, right? Or map channels, right? So if I, I can take exactly the same exactly same texture, and if I use it as a diffuse channel, right? It will basically be the color of my material. If I use exactly the same texture, but now as a displacement uh, channel, it means that I will basically uh, modify the surface, right? Or I can uh, modify the normals or whatever, right? Okay, so now, Let's talk about the types of textures. Um, so again, we, I think we already discussed a little bit about this. So we have, in general, like three types of textures and a lot of other very detailed different types. But in general, three types of textures. One is basically bitmaps, right? They're just created by predefined pixels. This, this can be just a photograph from your cell phone, um, some uh, texture that you can create in, 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 in Photoshop or GIMP or any of those uh, programs, right? So it's just, yeah, a bitmap, okay? Um, the other type of, of textures are these called procedural textures. And we have another, another type called volumetric. Actually, these two are somehow procedural. So volumetric is also a type of procedural textures. Um, basically, procedural is when, when we say procedural textures, we usually uh, are referring to 2D procedural textures. And sorry, uh, Trace to the Max is opening because I need to show you a couple of examples. So let me just minimize this because I needed to reset my entire computer because Zoom was not working. So yeah, okay. So basically, yeah, procedural texture 2D. This is basically a texture that is not created by an artist. This is just created by equations, right? And uh, the, there are a lot of uh, a different, in different softwares, there are uh, different solutions on how to create this type of uh, textures. Um, in Trees to the Max, for example, there is there are several procedural textures there. There's also an, a, a software called Substance Painter, which is a very sophisticated software to create shaders. Uh, this, is, this is used uh, for, um, I think mostly right now, I, I think Substance Painter is mostly used for uh, like big productions, for, for movies and things like that, but it's also used for video games, for very, very sophisticated, right, very high-end uh, video games. There's also Houdini, that is a very, again, a very sophisticated software for 3D. Uh, so Houdini is similar to Maya, to Blender, to Trace to the Max, but it's huge. In Houdini, um, it's, it's actually specialized in 
uh, procedural stuff. So you can create procedural animations, you can create um, procedural, procedural uh, explosions and models and also surfaces in Houdini. So let me show you a, a demo from the type of things you can do in Houdini. And why this is relevant, the thing is, in imagine that you are again, the owner of a, of a video game company, right? You need a lot of assets, right? And for all those assets, imagine, I don't know, you, have, you are creating an entire city with, with, I don't know, with a forest and a lot of things, right? Um, so you need a lot of assets. You need a lot of, uh, a lot of 3D models, a lot of textures, a lot of, a lot of stuff, right? You either need basically like, like an army of uh, 3D artists, right? A lot of people, right? In order to, to create all those assets, or you can go and get technical directors, which is basically the we in in the industry we call technical directors to people that are basically um, computer scientists with a little bit of artistic background, or sometimes there are artists with a lot of uh, computer science knowledge. But it's basically like a combination between an artist and and a programmer. So it's basically someone that can create art using math, right? TDs are usually the people that are creating these plugins and algorithms, right? So let me show you this. Let's see the video. So this is for this is an example of how can you create uh, procedural textures on Houdini. Um, so uh, I, uh, right now that the 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 trend the trend for uh, the interfaces regarding this topic is uh, using this type of um, node-based interfaces in which you are basically creating different stages of the algorithm, creating nodes, and you can basically create right different materials depending on variables. So as you can see, this guy is creating a very sophisticated texture, a very nice shaders, just moving, right? <laughs> playing with those numbers and playing with those uh, equations, right? I mean, he's not literally writing those equations, but a computer scientist had to create this type of shader. So basically, you could work in a company like this. You could work for Houdini or any other company that are doing this type of stuff. You could you could work in a video game company because this is very relevant right now. It's obviously cheaper, right, to get this type of textures uh, directly with an equation instead of having a lot of artists manually creating everything, right, like literally painting everything on uh, Photoshop, for example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue. So that is procedural 2D. Now let's talk about volumetric, right? Uh, again, these uh, volumetric textures, they can be totally procedural or kind of like a mix. So what happens with volumetric is imagine that, let me show you an example, actually, an example of a 2D a 2D, uh, very quickly, give me a second. Okay, so I will get, so this is a material editor from Tristan Max. I will get, give me a second. Yeah, I will show you a lot of demos today, actually. So for example, here I have different types of, of uh, maps. And some of these maps are actually procedural. So for example, we have the cellular one. That is the one I used, right, the other day. So I can double click here and I can see these things, right? So basically I can change uh, a lot of things. I can, for example, change the, the, the color of the cells. I can change the size, right? I can change the spread. Right? It's kind of affecting how this texture looks, right? So imagine that you have several var variables here, right? And those variables are basically affecting this image in terms of X and Y, right? This is basically an image and you can consider as a, uh, as a Cartesian coordinates that has X and Ys. And every pixel in that image has a coordinate of X and Y. And you're basically, your algorithm is deciding the color of, that, of those pixels according to some values, right? Well, with volumetric textures, imagine that you just 
get another dimension, right? Now you extend that to uh, 3D, right? So now your values can basically have, can basically create different textures, right? Moving now in, in Z value. So imagine for this cube, for example, imagine that this axis is the X axis of the image, this, right? This axis is the Y, right? And now this is Z, right? So with different depth, you can create different textures. These are impressively uh, useful, these type of, of textures, because as you can see, this thing appears to be a very complicated shape, but it's not. This is just a cube. But this cube is basically getting information from a procedural tree texture, and it's, it's, uh, it's render basically its colors depending on that, right? So it seems that it's actually 3D. It seems that it has this like holes and everything. It's, it's it, it has like a very intricate uh, things. Uh, so for example, you can create you with this type of uh, volumetric um, textures, you can create um, clouds and and again intricate objects like this. And is is very is very interesting, right? Um, okay. So another advantage of of procedural textures is that they can be naturally seamless. Have you ever heard the term seamless? Seamless texture? Okay, most, most people have heard already. So basically we, we say that a texture is seamless when the sides of the texture are basically matching, right? So basically the pixels or basically the structure of your image on the right side is matching the left side. So when, it's, when that texture is basically repeated, right? In a video game or anything, you can't see the seams. You you can basically see like a like a smooth flow from the texture. And it's, it looks very very good. So in contrast, a non seamless texture is is a texture that is basically not matching, right? So the the sides are not matching. So you can see the seams. You can see where that texture is basically um, not matching, right? It's basically like repeating. Sorry. Okay, uh, you're making comments on the chat, but yeah, I, I will try to not get distracted by the chat right now. Um, okay, so this is, this is basically what, uh, what uh, this is a non-seamless texture, right? So again, why is this important? Because in a, in a, in a, in a movie or in a video game, non-seamless textures are obviously forbidden, right? This it just looks horrible. And creating, for an artist, creating seamless textures is really hard. So if, if I give you this texture that is not seamless and you need to basically to make it seamless in Photoshop, it takes it takes a lot of time. I've done it before. I mean, believe me, it takes a lot of time. So again, if the texture is not created by an artist but created with equations, it's way easier, right? Because you are defining the texture, you are defining everything. You can make it seamless from the beginning. So it's way better and it's more valuable in, in, in that sense for uh, for uh, any company, right? So yeah, math is very valuable, which is good. Um, and this is this is a very interesting area also of, of research. Uh, there's a lot of people, for example, that are, they're also working with artificial intelligence for with deep learning, for example. Uh, there are a couple of papers in which you can, for example, take a picture of a texture you like. So imagine you just go outside and you see, oh my God, like the grass right outside my house is very nice. So you can basically take a picture or maybe a couple of pictures with your cell phone. And then a deep learning system, a convolutional network can basically take that as an example and can automatically create a texture that is very similar to the one, right, that you capture, but, but a, at a texture that is already seamless and it, it already has a lot of um, uh, like the, the the correct information you need for a video game. So that is a very relevant area. Um, I'm not sure, but I, I think some authors they don't necessarily consider that those type of textures as procedural. So usually the, the word procedural, it's some it's a texture or an, an animation or things like that that is literally generated using certain equations. So these other type of of, uh, of images, uh, they're probably like like uh, generative uh, uh, images or or learning based images, right? Or learning based uh, textures. 
But but again, it's a huge area of research, and a lot of people is investing a lot of money right now to come up with different ideas, right? Okay, good. So again, well, I mean, if I make a, a very large zoom for that texture, we can see that there are these seam, seams here, and it's obviously looking horrible. Okay. And uh, yes, and again, coming, coming again with volumetric textures, this is an example from a paper from Kopf. This is a already old paper from 2007, but it's a really nice paper because basically these guys were created, uh, they created an algorithm that can take a 2D texture and it can create a volumetric texture using a 2D texture as example. So this is incredibly interesting, right? So it basically the algorithm uh, learns the structure of that image and basically just come up with a volumetric uh, volumetric version, right? So you can create impressive, impressive things. Um, so in general, these type of textures are, uh, the computing is cheap and sometimes the memory access is expensive, but this is when they are kind of combined between being procedural and using bitmaps. What, what does this mean? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I have a note here. It says memory access is expensive if based on bitmaps. So these type of textures are also used in um, medical imaging. Okay. So sometimes what you have is not exactly an equation that is creating the colors for all those like depth layers from this from the volume, but actually you get that that color information, for example, from um, um, from a medical device, right? That maybe is like scanning your brain, right? So what you have is basically like a database with thousands of images and each image is basically the, the layer you need or the colors you need for a specific depth, right? In those cases, those type of textures are also considered volumetric textures, but it's kind of a different type, right? Because it, it, it's not a single texture, but more like like a database of different textures, right? So again, many, many bitmap, bitmap uh, textures on different depth, right? And um, so in that case, that will be very expensive in terms of memory, right? Because you just need to go and grab uh, all that information. They're also very heavy, but that is, that is usually uh, in uh, medical imaging, okay? Okay. There's uh, another use of textures, in particular for video games, is something called environment mapping. We use this to fake reflections. So we haven't talked about that uh, yet, about reflections, because that is a natural thing on ray tracing. But basically, imagine that you have something like this, like a teapot that is um, made out of gold or chrome or, or something like that. And, uh, well, it basically needs to to reflect its environment, right? So the way we usually mimic that in a very, very realistic way is by using ray tracing, right? We lead, you literally need to throw a ray from your camera that needs to impact in the surface of the object. And then you, right, you have the normal of that surface, so you compute the reflection vector. And then you throw another ray that is coming, right, on the direction of that reflection vector. And you basically keep going until that ray is basically touching another object, right? And you're basically collecting the different colors, right, that are reflecting in this surface. And that's how you basically render something like this, like a mirror or like, like a golden object, right? But that is super expensive. You will do that on your, um, your last coding assignment will be a ray tracer and we will do reflections. However, in real time, that is incredibly expensive to do. So the way we do it is we basically get a uh, we get an image from our environment, and we can map that image uh, either in a cube or in a sphere. And basically, we do a trick of um, mimicking this um, reflection or faking this reflection using a, that texture. So it's basically not using you not using rays, but it's just like projecting a surface in top, sorry, projecting a texture in, 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 in a surface. So let me show you an example of that. Um, give me a sec. 
Yes, so for example, here's an example of a reflection. This is obviously using WebGL, right? So there's an image in the back, right? It's just a photo. Well, it's not one photo, it's basically several photos of this place. And you basically stitch those photos in something like Photoshop or Game or something like that, and you create a very large photo that can have either a spherical mapping or a spherical distortion or a cube mapping, right? Or being distributed as a cube. And you put that as your environment, right? And basically when you are deciding the color of this fragment in particular, the way you the way 3.js or WebGL does is you get the fragment and the fragment has its interpolated value from uh, from the normals, right? So basically the normal of, of the surface in this point in particular is like telling you where that surface is looking, right? Because this, the normal is always perpendicular to the surface. So you just follow that direction to your cube because right i mean this the image that is on the back is literally like a cube right just literally grab the color that is exactly on the that is on the cube exactly on that uh, on that direction on the direction of the normal and that is why you decide the color of your of your fragment so you can fix something like this and it honestly looks really nice it looks really good and it's not uh, ray tracing right good so let me continue And there's another use for texture called light baking. Have you ever heard about light baking? Yes, okay, so a couple of people, some are not, okay, good. So light baking is basically a trick that we sometimes use to show a, a more realistic or sophisticated um, sophisticated lighting, right? When you are working with um, with real-time rendering, right? So basically, uh, and I, I, I actually, I, I will show you an example. Give me a second because that is, I need to open it on 3 to the max. This is, this is an example from a, this is from 10 years ago, actually. I was doing my master's degree and I, I, I was taking a, a video games course and we had to create a video game. So I made this video game that it was based like, uh, like in a in Mexican uh, hacienda. If you know, if you don't know what a, a hacienda is, hacienda is like a, like a big mansion, right? In the countryside, right? So continuing with, with this <laughs> October, topic right it's it, it was uh the goal was to create like a very spooky environment right with this house so this is basically this is basically the scene right so it's an entire entire hacienda for the video game and the thing that is that uh the goal with uh, when we're talking about baking or light baking is Imagine that you want to create something like this, a video game, and you want to have a very nice lightning. For example, look at look at the shadows here, right? They're very soft. This is difficult to achieve in 3D. I mean, I mean, and it was obviously way more difficult to achieve 10 years ago because I literally uh, took this, uh, I made this uh, 10 years ago. So th it, it, this is obviously uh, expensive, right? So light baking, what, what, what that means is you basically create all your assets, you create all your models, right? And you compute the lighting not with the uh, real-time rendering pipeline right? that, that, that we have discussed about, because uh, remember, there are two different types of rendering techniques. One is the real-time or the online rendering, and the other one is the ray tracing. Remember, ray tracing is always like the one that can achieve like super, super realistic, right? So uh, what I did in this case is, is, is that, right? I created all these models, right? I, I put everything in, in this like house and I created uh, uh, like, yeah, like the chairs and everything. And, uh, and then I compute the lighting using a, a ray tracing render engine. I think in this, in, this, uh, in particular, I think I use uh, a, a render engine called Mental Ray, which was very relevant a long time ago. Right now it's already discontinued. 
but uh, but it was it was really nice. So basically, what happens is you make your renders, and then the the colors and the sort and and the, and the shadows of your render, you basically use those as textures. So and somehow it's the lighting is basically pre-computed. So whenever you hear someone in computer graphics uh, using the term baking, baking it's always referring to something that is pre-computed. So light baking is like saying pre-computed lighting. Lighting, sorry. So you can achieve this type of effect. Um, so as you can see, like all the all the lights are like creating this very nice and spooky effects. Again, this this the intention of this was to make something spooky, right? And uh, I think the library has some interesting things, also, right? Yeah, so this is basically big. Look at these shadows, for example. This this is a very soft shadow that is, it's, even now it is, it will be very, very difficult to achieve these type of shadows in a real-time uh, environment or in re uh, real-time video game. And this is still very powerful. It seems, I mean, it is, a, it is already an old technique. It was not, it was not, uh, not new 10 years ago, but, um, but still, um, for example, if, if right now you are dealing with, uh, with content that is, that your intention, for example, is showing content on, on, a, on cell phones, or if you're dealing with a virtual reality or augmented reality, you need to increase your performance, right? So, all the tricks that you can you can use to increase your performance when you're in, in this case for example using virtual reality um, everything is welcome right and and this is still a very relevant technique and it's very useful it's very useful let me show you a couple of um, oh no I, I wanted to show you some of the textures but the thing is because I needed I had to to restart my computer, I'm not sure if I, I have it already there. Ah. Okay, no worries. Let's continue. Okay, so that is basically light baking. It's pre-computing the light, usually in a ray tracing render engine, and then you just basically uh, put that those effects and those shadows and everything in a texture. So this is basically this is the this is the map of basically the floor and the and the floor and the and the and the walls and everything and you can see the shadows here right so this uh thing right here is are, is basically the shadows of the table right and everything is already is already there on the texture so it's obviously super super fast because you're not computing anything right Someone is, is saying, show us the textures in the extra video. Yeah, maybe I can I can do an extra video. Okay, so let's let's take a break for notes. Actually, I can I can search for the textures while you are thinking on your questions. Because yeah, I, I, I can I can maybe get the, the textures. So if you have any question, please raise your hand. Yes, here are the textures. So here are the textures. They're basically different textures depending on like each stage from from the which like environment from the from the uh, hacienda so for example well these are from the kitchen this is really in spanish and this is yeah this is the one that we were looking this is basically the floor give me a sec Yeah, so you can see the texture and you can see all the details. You can see the, the, the shadows of the chairs already. So obviously the original texture doesn't have all the, all those details, right? All those colors. The, the original texture is just like a plain wood material, right? Or, or like these tiles, right? But you just uh, put that information on top of that texture, save it as a texture, and then you're just free to go. And that's perfectly fine. Obviously, something that is very important is whenever you want to use this technique um, for example this is the door this is a texture of one of the doors again with soft shadows and everything so whenever you want to use this texture it means that your final scene will not have lights right so typically there are no lights anymore 
there, you don't need to compute any lighting because everything is already there. Yeah, this is one of the chairs from the library, right? And so you can see all this textures, details, or well, lighting de the details. Okay, so any any questions? Okay, Tommy is asking, how do you generate the texture for light baking? Do you have to pre-render them literally? Okay, yeah, very good question. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not on Photoshop. It's not, it's not a, uh, no, that will be <laughs> incredibly uh, time consuming. No, this is done automatically. Um, in general, all this uh, so computer graphics software is like Blender, Maya, 3 Studio Max, Houdini, all those stuff. Uh, all those softwares, they already have that uh, implemented. So Trees to the Max has a light baking tool, right? So basically, yeah, you just need to do some uh, extra work, right? Uh, yeah, but it's, it's automatic. But, I mean, if someone wish to do it from scratch, um, yeah, it, it, it's not that it's not that trivial. It's not that trivial because what happens is, when you're creating a render, it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a ray tracing render or yeah. Let's let's talk about ray tracing render. If you are creating a render, right, you're basically creating like like the entire image, right, and things are occluded and things like that. So let's let's let me just go back a little bit because this type of rendering is is not trivial and it's it's a very good question actually. So let me show you an example again from the kitchen. You already know, right, that if we are rendering, for example, in, the, in this real-time rendering uh, technique that we have been discussed, uh, every single geometry that is not visible from the camera is just not being rendered, right? We don't spend time rendering things that are not visible to the camera, right? Light baking is different, right? Because there is no camera. If, if you had a camera, for example, imagine that the camera is here, right? And you wanted to use the, the actual render from that camera to kind of like bake the textures, that would be, that would be horrible because basically every, every part from, from this, for example, from the floor that is occluded by the table will be, will be completely black, right? So the thing is, what you want is you want to have like literally all surface covered because on, on your video game, the camera will move, right? So basically the trick here is you can use light baking when the lights are not moving, but the camera does, right? So light baking is different and the render engine for light baking on this either Maya soft image, well, soft image is dead, but <laughs> Maya uh, Blender or 3ds Max or any other uh, software, uh, they're not, rendering uh, a camera view they're rendering the they're rendering the the color of things directly from each object right so yeah the algorithms are are, are different uh, and and the pipeline is different it yeah it is it is completely different i i i actually don't know uh all the details so i will probably not not been able to tell you exactly how like the entire pipeline works, but it's, it's, it's completely a different pipeline, right? Because again, in, in those cases, you you will not occlude, you, you don't um, you don't clip anything, you don't backface uh, cooling everything. Everything should be there because you need to get the colors of, of every single surface. So every single triangle needs to be rendered. Yeah, it's totally different, very sophisticated and uh, to totally different algorithm. Okay, now let's talk about texture coordinates because I, I as as far as I saw, oh, some sorry, sorry, someone is asking, is light baking offline rendering? Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, usually it is. Uh, I, for example, I think Unity, and also UDK, uh, the, the 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 more modern versions, maybe from like five years ago. No, I don't know. Yeah, maybe from three years ago to to now. I think those versions, uh, you can al already do light baking on Unity or uh, UDK using online rendering techniques. So basically you're just boost your rendering, getting like the most amazing shadows and things like that are usually very expensive in, 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 in real time, but you bake everything and then you just reuse everything with baked textures. 
But usually, if you really want to achieve something super, super realistic, you will do uh, you will do it using offline rendering with ray tracing to get like this very, very realistic uh, uh, detail, right? Okay, so what happens with texture, co texture coordinates? Um, applying a texture on top of a surface is like, like wrapping that object with this, right? Like when you have a, uh, when you want to give a present to, to a friend and you have this like wrapping paper and you basically need to wrap these things, right? So somehow you need to wrap this texture on this bunny. So what happens is textures have coordinates. Those coordinates are not called X and Y, they're usually called U and V, okay? So for U and V coordinates, imagine that, well, not imagine, sorry, the coordinates of a texture are always from zero to one, right? That is how it's, uh, it's defined, right? Coordinates from textures are basically from zero to one. So what happens is that every vertex from your 3D model should have a texture coordinate, which means that if we are talking about a triangle, for example, uh, if we are, if we want to map a triangle with the coordinates with a texture, every vertex from that triangle needs to have a uh, a texture coordinate. Texture coordinate that is basically u and v, and is basically a number that goes from zero to one. So imagine this. This vertex right here, maybe its texture coordinate could be, I don't know, uh, 0 0.95 and maybe 0 0.52, something like that, okay? So every vertex, right, has a texture coordinate with respect to, uh, to the texture that we want to use. So the question is, how can we get the color from a portion of the triangle, right? Because in the end, we know we are not only t taking the color of the color of the vertices, but we actually need the color of the portions of the triangle, which are basically the fragments, right? So if you just take the color from each vertex, so imagine that you take this color right here, and this color right here, and this color right here, and then you just interpolate those colors for a point that is basically in the middle, you will not get this texture. You agree? You will not get this texture. Basically, all, all your the inner part of, your, of the triangle, all the pixels inside your triangle, will basically get like a weighted combination between this color and this color and this color. So that that is not what we want. We want to get the actual coordinates, the actual texture uh, from the file, right? So what we use is use we use barycentric coordinates, but it's kind of like like in a in a in a, um, in an opposite way. So what what uh, we need. So imagine you have this triangle and you have a point in the middle. Right, so you have the the actual space coordinates, the three D space coordinates for these three vertices, and you also have this the three D space coordinates for a fragment that is maybe here or somewhere in the middle of this triangle. Right, so what you do is you compute the barycentric coordinates for that point. Right, so again, this triangle is in some position in three space that that fragment is, it has also its own position in 3D space. You compute the barycentric coordinates. And for now, let's imagine that it's exactly in the middle. So the barycentric coordinates are 0 0.33, 0 0.33, and 0 0.33, okay? So basically one third for each one. Good. So now you go to your texture and you say, okay, this, the coordinates of these vertices on this texture so not the coordinates in 3D space, but the coordinates on this texture are basically this and this and this point, right? These are the coordinates on the texture. It's a different thing. This is a 2D space, right? That goes from 0 to 1. So then you get these barycentric coordinates that you had, this 0 0.3, 0 0.3, and 0 0.3, right? And you basically multiply each of these coordinates, right, of these 2D coordinates on the texture coordinates, you multiply those by 0 0.3 and 0 0.3 and 0 0.3, and what you will get is basically a new set of coordinates, U and V, right, for a point that is basically in the middle of the triangle, but now on the texture, right? So let, let's imagine that that point ends here, okay? So now you have literally the coordinates on your texture space to decide the color of that fragment. So in that case, the fragment will be purple, okay? So that is how we use basically get information from your texture. The good thing is that this is this is automatically already. This is these are the type of things that you don't need to program anymore. 
It's already done in 3.js and in WebGL, and you don't need to care about it. Okay, now let's talk about mapping. Okay, so again, you need a texture coordinate for every vertex. So mapping is basically how you distribute your image or your texture on the surface. So there is there are some automatic mapping techniques that are basically um, distribute those textures depending on a certain uh, on a certain shape. So uh, so this is one one time basically planner. So as you can see, for example, if we could see the bunny from top, right? The texture will look kind of good because basically everything is like projected in in a, this planner fashion, right? And this is a different one. It's cylindrical. It means that the texture is like wrapping the bunny, right? Like a cylinder. So obviously it looks different, right? It's just a different way to wrapping the texture. There's a spherical approach and there's the box approach. And I think right now you probably will uh, um, agree with me that this is not entirely correct. I mean, this doesn't look this doesn't look necessarily good. So these automatic mapping te techniques using box, sphere, sphere, um, either box, spherical, cylindrical, or planner, these are, these are very useful when your object is almost a box, almost a sphere, almost a cylinder, or almost a plane. In those cases, that is perfectly fine, right? But when you have a way more complicated object like this, this is obviously wrong. The problem is that it is distorting the texture, right? So this um, this um, the squares from the texture, right? Some squares on this bunny, right? Some squares are very tiny with respect to the to the area of, of the surface, and some are actually very big. So a correct mapping for for an object, right? Uh, it should be similar to this one. So as you can see, here we are using almost exactly the same example. It's also a checkered texture with with uh, little squares. But what you can see here is that the squares have almost the same size in, on, on the entire surface. Having exactly the same size is literally, literally impossible. If, if the surface is very intricate, that is literally impossible. But the goal is basically to distribute the texture in such a way that the texture is not shrinked or, or um, uh, yeah, or distorted, right? So, this uh, what we do in these cases it's called parametrized it's called parametrization or unwrap so this is similar to basically like trying to flatten an orange skin right so you have a 3d model which is very complicated like this face right you want to distribute something that is planar you literally need to basically to get information that is in a 2, 2d domain into a 3d domain right into a different um, into a different type of space, right? So imagine that you want to you, you need to, to 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 do something like that. You take an orange, you basically cut the orange of the, the, the orange skin, and you want to flatten the orange skin. Do you think it's possible? It, it, you think it's possible to flatten to completely flat uh, flatten uh, an orange skin? It's not possible, right? You will get bumps, right? You either get bumps. Or if it needs to be flat, you need to kind of a stretch, right? You will need to to, to, to have this uh, skin from the orange to be a little bit of flexible, to be maybe like stretch it a little bit for being able to flat, right? And so this is basically what you do when you do uh, on wrapping, right? And it's not trivial. Again, there's a lot of research in this area. There are probably hundreds of papers on CGRAPH talking about parameterization. It is a very hard problem for for very complicated and intricate um, uh, 3D models, it is it is a really, really, really uh, bad problem. Uh, and Nami is asking, depends on the topology of the 3D model. Okay, so for, some, for some of you that you might don't understand what Nami is asking, <laughs> topology is how the edges of the mesh are distributed on the surface, okay? <laughs> Everybody says might. <laughs> yeah, we haven't we haven't talked about topology. Topology is uh, is part of geometry. Actually, we will talk about topology when we discuss the geometry. But but again, remember uh, the thing is, imagine that 
I have exactly the same surface, but instead of having quads, I have triangles. Those 3D models will have different topology. So topology is how is your how basically your mesh is constructed in terms of how uh, if it's uh, triangles or quads or how is basically those quads or triangles are distributed on, on the surface. So it's a very good question, M. Is uh, is not is not related with topology. So basically, you can have uh, you can have exactly the same face, right? Imagine the same three D model with different topologies, right? And you could unwrap those models exactly like exactly the same, uh, and not depending on the on, on topology. So it's it's more depending on the curvature of the surfer, surface. So it's not depending on the topology, but it's depending on the curvature. So a, an object that has more curvature is, ob is obviously harder to map, right? Because higher curvature, you basically cannot unwrap it, right? So yeah, it is very hard. This is a very, very hard problem. Okay, so quick so questions. Raising hand. Yeah, we are, we are out of time. Uh, that is true. The thing is, we started late. So I wish to take a, a bit more minutes. Again, if you need to go because you have another class, that's perfectly fine. But I think I will I will spend a little a little bit more minutes because I I, I want to to finish, and we started 10, 10 minutes uh, late, right? Because we had this Zoom problem, right? So yeah, if if you if you uh, if if it's if it's okay for you, yeah, I I I, I would like to continue. Okay, so no, no raising hands. Great. So again, remember, if you need to leave, that's perfectly fine. Everything is recorded, so you can you can uh, see the view later. Okay, so this is basically the example, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't go yet because this is basically what you need to do in your in your assignment. So this is what you do in 3.js. Um, basically, usually the way we do it is you pass the texture as a uniform variable, right? So this is basically the code you need. Fortunately, again, 3.js makes everything super, super easy. You basically get everything directly. So you pass, again, the texture as a uniform variable. And then the UVs are passed to the vertex shader directly. Uh, and again, I mean, you don't need to write this. So please, I mean, this is just an example, but you don't need to write this part. So that is also, that is basically automatic. So now when you have, when you're basically on the fragment shader, you only need to create a sampler 2D, which is in this case is basically like your texture, right? The texture information, um, which is the one that is coming right from uh, the, your uniform that is coming here and is getting this file texture.jpg. You need to create a variant variable, which is our, where basically the text coordinates. And again, that is literally automatic. You're literally taking the, the, the texture coordinates from your 3D model. And, and that's it. So the way you capture the color of the of the texture for that fragment in particular is like this. You just say texture 2D, you basically send the texture and the texture coordinates, and that's it. So if in that fragment in particular the, co the color of the texture is blue, this variable will be blue, and that's it. Okay, it's super, super, super easy. It's very fast. And uh, yeah, everything is automated. So. Shader assignment. So I wanted to show you the bonus part of the shader assignment. I, I spent a lot of time doing this uh, again because we have this um, October stuff. So this is this is what you will need to achieve, the type of effect that you will need to achieve. So we have the bunny back, right? And um, so there are a lot of interesting things happening here. First, we have these leaves, right? So those are just objects with opacity with transparency and again you know that you can use maps right uh, to to basically decide if something is uh, transparent or not um, we have some uh, interesting materials in this case the material of the of the squash so you have all you have all the maps you have you need to create the velvet effect for the table you can also create the velvet effect for for the the hat so the bunny has a really nice, like a Harry Potter hat. And this is also interesting. Can you see the clock, right? The clock here. This clock is kind of like moving 
by with air with the air right it's kind of moving so what do you think is that is that you need to do that where in fragment shader vertex shader what do you think <laughs> it is fake so. what do you think vertex shader or fragment shader the cloak moving yeah vertex shader yeah okay so basically the, the the knowledge you need to achieve this type of effects, you almost have everything um, because the transformation assignment, you, you almost have everything. Uh, the, yeah, this is basically at, at level of, of vertex shader. The, the trick there is, as you can see, there's, there's, a, there's some parts of the cloak that are not moving, right? So not every vertex from the cloak is moving, right? And again, you can use textures to decide either the amplitude of your sine wave or the the timing of your sine wave or or yeah or if the sine wave is affecting the vertices or not and things like that so yeah i hope you like it uh something that you might notice is that the leaves are obviously intersecting objects right so we have no collision don't worry about that collision is one of the most difficult things that you can achieve in computer graphics is very, very hard. So don't worry about that. Obviously, your, your scene, right? The leaves are going to yeah intersect everything. Don't worry about that. And take this as just as an inspiration. So you, the, the goal for you is to achieve this, this effect. Uh, but you can obviously play with all those things. And, and I'm also, I'm giving you all the models and I'm, I'm giving you all these um, textures. So I created three different textures for for the leaves so you can have like different colors and things like that and uh yeah that's it so thank you so much yeah and sorry 50, 56 minutes so it's not that bad okay thank you so much and i see you on friday unless you have a question oh uh, okay david is asking how was the midterm okay i finished i already finished the mid the, the gradient of the midterm without the extra okay so as far as I remember, the average from the midterm was around 79. But again, but that is before the extra, okay? So we are still uh, grading the extra. And, uh, but yeah, that is, I, I yeah, I, I think that was, that was, I, I, th I think, at least in my perception, I, I think it was not as bad as, as you thought. Uh, but yeah, yeah, okay, good. Any other question? No? Okay, good. Thank you, everybody. See you on Friday. Bye.